sometimes we have time series data and analyzing time series data, even visualizing time series data can be a challenge because typically you have many columns of data, so many variables, and we have many rows of data, and each row could be a second, a minute, an hour, a day. In any sort of analysis, visualization is the key to understanding the data, but validating the data is also critically important, and sometimes it's very difficult because when we have time series data, the data can be contaminated with noise and all sorts of artifacts. So the software package that we use to visualize the data is really important. Uh, in a recent study we've been doing on the fuel economy of vehicles. And so I'm going to use that as an example to show you this software package that we have. And we call it Process Insights. It's a reissue of Process Insights from the late 1990s. So what we have is a, a car that's been tested on a dynamometer. A dynamometer is a treadmill that the car sits on. And while the car is being driven on the dynamometer, we're collecting data from the car's computer on a second-by-second -second basis. And also, uh, instrumentation is capturing the emissions from the tailpipe, analyzing the pollutant concentrations and the flow rate of the uh, those emissions. And from the emissions concentrations and the flow rate, fuel consumption, grams per second of fuel consumed is calculated. So let's look at the data here. If I click on Y variables, you see the variables that are available in this data set. If it starts with engine, these ones, for example, are engine variables obtained from the engine's computer, and these two variables at the bottom, dyne, are obtained from the dynamometer data. So let's just look at some of these variables, and we'll go speed, RPM, throttle position, mass airflow, and commanded equivalence ratio, and make a plot of them. So here we see 6,000 or so observations, or one-second observations, and all these variables on the screen. And first, I want to give you a little tour of the, some of the tools that are available to us. First of all, this plot is versus row number, and I can change that to a time series. So now at the bottom of the screen, we have the date and time of each of the data points. I can change it to a histogram. So here we have a histogram. I can change the number of bins. I can make it 50 bins, let's say. And so we have, for example, the cycles. We have three cycles that are involved. If I just click on the bar, it tells me that, for example, this first one was a federal test procedure in 1975, and it has 1,880 observations. I can change the number of bins, as I mentioned before. I can make a lot of them. And then if we look down here in the bottom, it commanded equivalence ratio. If you remember your chemistry, stoichiometry means that you have exactly the amount of air and fuel that is being burned. So when the commanded equivalence ratio is 1, the engine is operating at stoichiometric, and so that's what this little bar is here at 1. But we want to zoom in. Can, there's also a bunch of little points at the bottom. So if we go up to the zoom box in the upper right and click that, we can come down and draw a little rectangle around this data down here and hit Apply Zoom, and it blows that histogram up. Then if we hit Info, we can click on these different bars. For example, this one shows that the equivalence ratio is about 0.94, and there are 52 observations. And then if we want to go back to the, where we came from, we can undo Zoom. So that's an example of how we can use some of those boxes to move around in the data. Let's go back to row number. What else do we have? These two boxes over here give us a, a way to view different portions of the data. Right now, we start with row one, we go 6,200 rows. Let's say we only wanted to go 500 rows. We've zoomed in on the beginning of the data, and we can use the arrows over at the right here to scroll through the data pretty rapidly. Okay. We also have the percent box down here. We can look at, you know, if we want to look at 20%, we can do that. We can look at all 100% again. Now, one of the things with data that I mentioned before is quality checking. And if we look at the purple points here, mass airflow, grams per second, we see three points that are very high compared to all the other data. And so we're wondering about those points. 
are those good points or bad points? One thing we can do is come over to zoom and we can draw a rectangle, a vertical rectangle around that vicinity and we can hit apply zoom and now we've zoomed in on the individual data points and here's this odd point, what is its value? Its value is 297 grams per second is an unusual value. What we want to do is consider cutting this data from the data set, these three points. So we come up to the upper right, there's a cut Y box. We click that, we come over here to this data set. As I drag this on, you can see it makes little red markers. Okay, these are good data down here. I don't want to cut those out, but I want to cut out these ones up here. So if I highlight them like that and then hit apply in the upper right, it changes those data points to red dots, meaning those are deleted from the data set. However, you notice they're still being plotted. If we hit info and hover over a point here, it'll tell us that the value was cut, but it'll tell us what the original value is. Okay. Now, when we did that, when we marked those three points, it does not really remove them from the data set. It writes a transform. And in this transform box, it's a lower right. If I open that up, you can see here this transform that I've highlighted. It tells the software what to do. It says cut all values of mass airflow above 258. And I can go in and edit that value if I want to and to make the, the cut more precise. I can also remove that transformation by pushing delete and updating the data set. And then when we go back, you see those points are now restored to the data set. So once we've deleted the points, they're not gone forever. And that is a frequent problem in editing data. You delete that data point, you later find out that it was actually a good value. Another thing we have is we have control over the symbols here a bit. We can use points and lines. I have points and lines turned on right now. We can turn off the points and get only the lines or we can turn off the uh, lines, get only the points, and both of these things give us a different view of the data. Here we can see those three data points again, and you can see they're isolated. There's no points leading up to going from the bottom to the top. Another thing that's convenient is control over the scaling. Right now, the scales are auto-scaled. If I click in the scale zone, I have three choices. I can use display for the minimax of the displayed data or I can change it to the variables min and max values, or I can put my own values in. So let's say I'm really interested in a particular value of mass airflow of 0 to 50. Now that variable has been blown up. So let's look at some of this data in a little bit more detail now, getting kind of at the problem. If I look at mass airflow, that's the air going into the engine through the air cleaner and mass fuel rate. And then I zoom in on this. And these are stacked. Okay. So on the top we have the mass airflow. On the bottom we have the mass fuel rate. They should go up and down together in time with each other. We have these two little arrows in the lower left that give us reference lines that we can drag across. So here we see a peak in the mass fuel rate on the bottom, the red, but its airflow is really about 10 seconds earlier. And you can see what rows we're on by looking in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. You can see that row number, that gray, gray box that they're changing. So there's a time delay between these two. Now, I had already time aligned the data based on speed, so this is some other sort of time delay that's coming in here. So one feature of these, these two time series is that one is the delayed from the other. The other feature is that the mass airflow is more jagged. It has more high frequency up and down information in it compared to the dynamometer data in the bottom. The bottom is more smooth. And the reason for this is that as the exhaust gas moves through the exhaust system into the instrumentation, the species are diffusing. And so the high frequency information that's at the engine is lost as it moves to the dynamometer. So what we want to do is try to connect the mass airflow to the mass fuel rate. Remember this is a fuel economy study. We want to 
be able to predict the mass fuel rate from all the vehicle information that's provided on the computer. The computer does not tell us what the mass fuel rate is. So one way to do this is to build a model where we're going to use mass air flows to predict the mass fuel rate. Now, the thing about this is there's, since there are two factors going on, we need to consider two things. There is the, the time delay of about 10 seconds, and then there's the diffusion. And so to do that, we're going to build a model that has time delays that center around a 10-second time delay, but they start earlier and last longer than, the, than a 10-second delay so that essentially we are taking the mass airflow and moving it back and forth in time to make the smoothing that we see down in the bottom. So I have already built a model to do this. Let me go over and show you how I set up that model. So it's going to be a prediction model. And we have this, this window. And I want to load that model if it's not already loaded. I want to load demo one. So what this shows, this model has nine inputs and one output, and we're going to train it on 3,246 one-second observations. What is the model I've already set up? If I look over here to the right, here I have the mass fuel rate from the dynamometer, and it's called output. That's our output, and it's at time zero. The inputs that I have are to the left, Mass airflow, grams per second, and here I have it centered. Minus 10 means it's 10 seconds before input, and then I'm, going to, I'm doing a bunch of different time delays before and after that so that I can do that rounding that I want to get. So I've already built the model, and it takes a few minutes to build. I wanted to do that in advance here. Let's go see what it produced. Okay, so I'm going to run the data through the model. And it gives us a parity plot. In this case, this is the predicted on the vertical and measured on the horizontal. It looks pretty good. It uh, has an R squared of 0.99. And in many cases, we'd be happy about that. But if you look along here, you see some points that are off the line. At the bottom, there's this little hook. Okay, and we're kind of curious about that. So what we can do is I'll just do that again. At this time, I'm going to push this button that will append the predicted values to my data set. So it ran again. And now if I go back to the plotter, the plot screen, and I make this a little wider so we can read them, you'll see there's a new variable, 15, at the bottom. It's the predicted values that we just put on there. So now let's compare the measured with the predicted on a time series basis. Okay, there's the whole thing. Let's look at just about, well, I think 200 worked well. As I move across, and I'll turn on the points. Now you can see that the predicted one on the bottom is just as smooth as the dynamometer measured ones are on the top. Okay, they look pretty good, but how well do they compare? Well, one thing we can do is we can overlay them. Okay, now let's go back here and look through here. Well, it looks pretty good. Uh-oh, what's this? Okay, whenever we say uh-oh, we know we're going to make a big discovery. So we keep, here's another one. Okay, this is an unanticipated result. We expected that the fuel rate would follow the mass airflow throughout if the vehicle stays in stoichiometric operation. So these are cases where the engine is going into non-stoichiometric operation. It's unanticipated, and we want to say, well, what kind of operation are those things? What we can do is we start looking through these other variables and say, well, what other ones could we bring to the plot and commanded equivalence ratio, since we know it's a measure of leanness and richness, of that is, of non-stoichiometric operation, we can add that to the plot. And now what's coming in is the brown line. And so what we see, I'll go back to the beginning here, 
is okay let me explain the brown line one is stoichiometric okay so that right in there is stoichiometric two is very lean and specifically the fuel is actually turned off that the engine is not using fuel for those few seconds and when it's below uh, one like in this case here it's rich that might be the situation if you did a wide open throttle or something so if we go through here okay so right in here we see here's one of those discrepancies the model is the pink so the pink says I think that the fuel flow should be this but the dynamometer measured the blue okay is measuring a lot less fuel flow in that region and if we move one of our reference lines over we find out when we're about here the discrepancy starts that's at the location where the fuel is being cut off to the engine okay when we get over to this point the fuel flow is resuming again and then the dynamometer indicates that the fuel flow to the engine is coming back and this we see throughout here repeatedly here's another one where we had the engine was the fuel flow was cut off this is good here's another one over here on the left here's another one now in this case we have a discrepancy between the modeled and the measured this turns out this is a cold start in other words the vehicle had been sitting off all night and it was started the next day and during these conditions special things go on to help an engine run well this is not explained by fuel being off or on but it turns out that this particular value of equivalence ratio right in here is 1.025 explains why there's a, there's a discrepancy there I just wanted to, to get across to you in this, this little example that we made this discovery with the software over about a one hour period a couple weeks ago and we could not have done it without the ability to present the data and to go into it and zoom in and plot things in different ways and build, build that, the model that I mentioned. We've loaded up data sets that are five million observations and you know a hundred variables. So that it's just limited by the size of your computer. It doesn't seem to be software limited.